It should be going just fine. Yep, looks like it. All right. If you would, open up your Bible to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Last Wednesday night, we got to the end of John 14. And John 14 was all about what? Somebody sum up John 14 for us. Alright, so uh, John 14, as Gary said, it's all about the time when Jesus would go away and the Holy Spirit would come to fill that gap while he was gone to guide the disciples into all truth and to bring them into remembrance of the things that he spoke. Now, the reason why I wanted to bring that back into your memory is because this chapter division here in John 15, it's a, you know, it's an okay chapter division. But we can't lose sight of what we had just studied in John 14 when we get into John 15. Otherwise, we're going to misinterpret this uh, sort of parabolic statement of Jesus that he's about to make. Okay, so if we don't keep in mind what he said in John 14, we're going to miss what he's trying to say in this saying of his in John 15 about the vine and the branches. So I'm going to read this uh, entire section uh, for for now, and then we're going to go back and look at it verse by verse. We're going to start reading in verse 1, and we're going to go down to verse 11, and I'm going to read this entire text, and then we're going to go back in it verse by verse. John 15, 1 through 11. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Verse 11 finally says, These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Okay. Um, You don't have to be, I'm not asking for the right answer, I'm asking for the possible answers. What are the possible answers uh, for what it means by that the disciples would bear fruit? Not what's the right answer, but... Let's get as many possible answers as we can. Our line? Our... And that's talking about the only reason that public, you know, the, the Jews, that have uh, lost out some years of Israel. So. Okay, so. They're reaching them, and but they're going to stretch out further later, but they're reaching their, the Jews, and, you know, because they have the Holy Spirit to direct them. So the fruit is uh, when they convert people. Yeah. That's the fruit. Okay. Amen. Or what are some other ideas, some other possibilities? You don't have to be, you, you might agree with Johnny, or Ryan might agree with Lonnie, but uh, that's okay because I've got a free pass because Johnny called me Gary last night, and so we're, you know, this is just going to have to happen. I've got nine brothers and sisters. I don't know a single one of their names, so you're going to have to bear with me. <laughs> okay, uh, fruit could be converts. What are some other possibilities? You might agree with Lonnie, but what might be some other possibilities what the fruit could be? Okay, so basically uh, actions that go towards God. Okay? What? Gary? A vine gives energy strength to a branch. And so they and God would be glorified because they are drawn the strength, the energy that they would have from Christ, who is the vine. So there's some kind of ethereal 
Okay. Any any other guesses? Okay. So we, we have conversion, just general good works in the church. We have uh, just the, uh, the energy that they would draw from Christ. And then we also have miraculous works. I think those are all four you know, pretty good options. Up until I studied for this lesson, I thought it was converts. But I've actually changed my mind on that. And let me give you a reason why. All right, here's the outline of uh, here is the outline of John 15. You have Jesus is the vine, and the disciple is a branch. Okay, and the fruit it does not come off the vine; it comes off the branch, right? Okay, if it's converts, and that disciple does wrong, what happens to the branch? Okay, does that not include the fruit that's on it? So if you take the convert idea from my perspective, from, from the way that I've been reading this passage uh, leading up to this lesson, it seems like that doesn't really fit because the fruit would be torn off with the branch. You get the idea? Let me give you an alternate, alternative view, though, uh, that I think you might appreciate. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Because he just has talked about the Spirit. And so Galatians chapter 5 he says this in verse 22 and 23. Somebody uh, read that for us. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Okay. So the fruit of the Spirit are these, and he lists all these here. I think this is the fruit that Jesus is talking about in John 15. If they're not producing that fruit, they're going to be taken down and cast into the fire. Um, that is, look at, look at the, uh, script, the scriptures prior to this, verses 19 through 21. If somebody doesn't produce, or, or rather, if somebody does produce the works of the flesh, or the fruits of the flesh, you could say, in 19 through 21, notice verse 21. He's, he tells them at the very end of that passage, Just as I forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, when in Jesus' parables, what happens to those that aren't inheriting the kingdom of God? Like the like the like the tares versus the wheat. What happens to the tares? Cast into the fire, okay? Uh Lonnie? I'm still convinced that he's talking about reaching other people and and, and this is telling them modestly that they have to have in order to do the work. So, to me, and this scripture is teaching them, so they can reach more people by converting them, but, this, but later on, Paul's talking about it, he's teaching them the part that they got to have in order to be able to reach them. Okay, so, let me ask you this, because uh, this, this is a debate that I had with myself leading up to this lesson. So, uh, if, if John 15 is talking about disciples, is it possible for someone to go to heaven without ever converting somebody else into Christ? As long as the person is doing their best, you know, doing the will, they may not be able to convert anybody, but you got to be trying, producing, trying to produce. Okay, so in John 15, it's, it tells them that, uh, let's see, where is that, where is that, where is that, where is that, where is that? Uh, it tells them if they did not produce fruit, then what would happen to them? If it's not able to produce anything, then, as he said in the parable earlier, he, it, is, it is good for nothing to be cut down and burned. Okay. Right. So if this is talking about converts, if the fruit is converts, then you've got a problem because not everybody produces fruit in that way. But I agree with you in that it's the effort put forth. And that's the same thing that Gary was basically saying. And it's the same thing that Zelda was basically saying. And when you think about the miraculous element of it, uh, even what Ashley was saying and what you were saying, go, all goes into it into one, one answer. It's more about their, what does the, okay, so look, look up here in the, in the beginning of the text. What is it that, what is it that prunes them? What is it that, you know, makes it so they can bear fruit? You look at verse 3, it's the word which I've spoken to you. 
And so this is more about what the Word of God, how the Word of God impacts their lives and changes their lives, uh, and, and less about um, going out and converting people. That's part of it, definitely. But I don't think, if, if we take that to its logical conclusion that this is what this passage is talking about, then I think we've got an issue with, one, the branch being cut off. See, I'm not, I'm not somebody's fruit. I'm my own branch, and you're your own branch, and you're your own branch. Now, somebody did teach me the gospel, and I was, I was baptized in response to that, but I'm not dependent upon them hanging on to the vine. If they get cut off, I'm not going to fall off, right? If, you, if there's fruit hanging from a vine and you cut off the branch, then all the fruit falls to the ground. But see, we're all our own independent branches. And so that's some of the things I was wrestling with and dealing with this text. Any co- thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, I wouldn't follow. You know, you may be right the way you think it, but I think a lot of times we look at a scripture and then we may, may, may get it tied up with some other scripture that may not be pointing to the same thing. It could be related to, uh, to something else rather than to this. Right. Know, because if you're saying that, hey, we're using this, this to where he said if a branch doesn't bring out fruit, the vine doesn't bear fruit, you know, it's no good for nothing to use down and cut off over weight. But then, over here, when you're going back to Galatia, I think that's two different. Well, I get, I get what you're saying. Just because they both mention the Spirit, just because they both mention fruit, doesn't mean that they're both talking about the same thing. Um, but whenever you look at what each, what each passage teaches, I think you, at least I, I can see that they're parallel in some sense. Because here in John 14, he's talking about sending the Spirit. They're being purified through the Word. They're being pruned through the Word. And if they're not, then they're going to be cast into the fire. If they don't produce good fruits, they're going to be cast into the fire. And so, to me, it seems that this passage in Galatians 5 would be, are connected in some sense. But if, you know, that is, that is true, that just because they both mention fruit and spirit doesn't mean they're talking about the same thing. Uh, Johnny, you continue on since you introduced uh, that. Where man is fruit, if, uh, if not where you're in Galatians, it will tell you what the fruits of the spirit are. Right. You know, if... You convert me. If I don't bear fruit, then I'm no good. No fruits are here when Galatians is speaking about. Those fruits that we should bear. That's what the way we should be. That will show that we have the fruits of the Spirit by the way that we live in our act or whatever it is. And if we're not bearing those fruits, if we're not doing this, this means that we're going to be cut off. Uh, Lonnie? It's, just, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's your conduct. It's like, uh, my conduct being in front of somebody might persuade a person for me to take a second look and say, you know, they might want to be that way, you know, or something like that. You know, it's how we behave ourselves. As long as we, if, if, if you have respect to life for yourself, then you, you will have it for others also. So if you live in that type of life as a Christian, people's going to begin to say, one day, just because, remember that, uh, who was that, uh, uh, Paul, I think, or what Paul said, we are written epistles. You know, right. that, that people are reading up the things that we do and, and the way we do it and the we might be able to be able to gain a person through that way without even talking by the way we live. But if we live in a way that people are always saying negative things and you are doing negative things, then you won't be able to bear the fruit. You know, but but I, I, I think that Christ's whole, Christ's whole duty was trying to reach the lost house of Israel. And so that's what he was trying to do. And all the parable he was teaching was about those people and what was going on. So he was trying to gain them. And then he talked about the parable of the tree uh, that was, he was going to cut down at one time. But some said, no, let us dump it and let us work it. And maybe when you come again, it might be all right. But sometimes some people get stunned and, and not ever grow anything. And uh, and if a person is doing right and they don't gain anybody, that's up to the Lord because He's gonna meet you on the level where you were at. Out. Gary, you had something to Ashley. In respect of context, in John 15, Jesus is talking specifically to the apostles. Uh, in Galatians 5, Paul is writing to the churches of Galatia, the 
Christians. And so we have to keep that in mind. But also, with respect to parables, a parable cannot be perfect in every representation. Otherwise, it would not be a parable. It would be the opposite. And so, as, as I think we have, we have to look at that as we look at any parable, is that that it, it speaks of things that are parallel. So, so you have a storyline that teaches what the object is. And so, uh, but I think the main thing, again, is respect to context. Why he's speaking specifically to his apostles, which they have to bear fruit because of the things that they're having through the power of the Holy Spirit. They have to have fruit in terms of converts, whereas the disciples, the Christians, it goes back to your statement, can someone go to heaven without ever producing a convert? And I think then the context in Galatians 5 is applicable to us and everybody else that wants to be a Christian. Ashley? Yeah, um, I, I, I will say that automatically that I think it's that Galatians 15 thoughts and you know this is uh, the one thing about this in John 15 is he doesn't come out and tell us what he, exactly what he means by what he's saying so you know we can uh, we can try our best to figure out exactly what he means but you know generally without him telling us exactly what he meant there might, there's always going to be some disagreement between people I'll tell you what it's not though <laughs> and I've heard this said before it's not uh, Jesus is divine and the branches are denominations now, that's not what it's talking about. The branches are individuals. Now, whether the fruit is converts or whether the fruit is your conduct that produces converts or produces other branches, uh, you can you know decide for yourself. Here's another passage I thought was interesting in this subject, and this is in Second Peter chapter one and verses. Um, that's exactly right. Yes, you are. You're getting good at that. You're figuring out how it works. And if you do figure out how it works, please call me and tell me because <laughs> I don't think I'm quite there yet. Second Corinthians, or no, Second Peter chapter 1 and 5 through 8. Somebody, uh, actually, since you actually found that, can you go ahead and read that for us? And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day. Since you are truly glad. Is that Second Peter? Oh. Okay. Second Peter one five through eight. Right. Second Peter one five through eight. There we go. That's okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lonnie. And good, good catch on that one, Ashley. Okay, so if you, if you notice, I'm not saying that these 
that these passages have to be parallel, but just notice the connections between the two. Uh, in John 15, he talks about the word that he taught to them. Uh, it pruned them to allow them to have produce more fruit. And in this passage, it talks about uh, their life basically being changed and perfected. Um, obviously, this, this perfection is brought about through the, uh, as he says in verse 1, through that like precious faith, 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Through that like precious faith, the base for all of these, uh, all of these um, personality changes, basically. And he says if these qualities are in you and are, and are increasing, if they're be in you and abound, you're not going to be unfruitful. You're not going to be barren. And particularly in this case, it's in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. But it's not just, it's not just the knowledge, but it's the application of that knowledge uh, that would, as seen in verses 5 through 7, that would make sure that they wouldn't be unfruitful. So, Well, you know, uh, uh, some people, you know, go back to the parable about uh, the seed falling in different places. Some people will receive it gladly, but then later on they fall by the wayside. That's true. You know, because their heart is not in. You know, and, uh, those, those people that will go wayward, but you still have to reach back and try to gain them again. Yep, that's true. Anybody else? Zelda? And that's why we have to be constantly always examining ourselves and see where our lives are at and how we conduct ourselves and stuff because you know I, that I, I always remember that always I was saying person never really measures you by this they measure you by your life and what you proclaim you proclaim a lot of times we proclaim that we are, we are good wholesome Christians and then we all of a sudden something flare up and we don't. Right. You know, so you know, you have to look at things and say, we're gonna have that we have problems or whatever, but we gotta hold fast and try to hold on to each other. And when you see one 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 girl away, we gotta try try to reach out, grab that person to bring them back. But you're gonna know if that person is really wholesome in what they're saying saying and what they're professing because they either come back or that's just your personal Wishy-washy. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to latch on to something that Ashley mentioned, and that was if you have fruit and the fruit, uh, if the fruit's is, is the converse, and, you're, and the person that you've converted ends up not remaining faithful, and everything you try to do and everything you try to show them through example and through mm-hmm. word doesn't get them back, then you're not going to be held accountable for their actions. But before I do that, let's see what, Lonnie, what you have to say? No, no, no. I, I just wanted to mention that what, what, uh, what you were talking about earlier about the ranchers. Yes. You know, and there are uh, so many people who believe that in different churches, they believe that they are a branch separate from somebody else. And uh, they believe that and they teach that. And that's what a lot of people believe. So you got to learn how to deal with that if you go out and all right, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and thank you all for your comments. And we're going to touch on this subject that Ashley brought up. What happens if you convert somebody and they don't remain faithful? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to read here uh, in verse 10, and I'm going to actually read down to verse 15, another lengthy section of scriptures. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15. Okay. Uh, Paul writes here, According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. Uh, For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, 
and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, uh, yet so as through fire. What are your thoughts on this passage? I know it's talking about uh, building on the foundation, which is Jesus Christ, and this is the way we build on it that uh, we'll be tested. We'll, we'll be tested, you know, whatever we do. But this is talking about people that don't have deceitfully in a certain side thing. You know, right. That all they work that they have, they're going to be tested. That whatever you do, you're going to be judged by it. You know, what I'm and I don't think it's talking about real fire. It's talking about judgment. Sure, it's, it's talking about the fires of. Tribulation and judgment, things like that. Kind of like First Peter 4, right. the fiery trial which is among you. Right. Uh, let's look at verse 15. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through these fiery trials, or through these judgments. What, what do you think that passage means? I, I look at it like Job. Okay. Job lost a lot in life, but Job did not give up his faith on Christ. Okay, that's an interesting way to look at it. Um, here's the way that this passage was explained to me one time, and I don't agree with this way, and I'm sure you're not going to either. Uh, basically, if someone, if they sin and they sin and they sin, then all those sins are going to be burned up, but they're going to get to go to heaven anyways. I don't think that's what this passage is talking about. Uh, the context of this passage, though, is evangelism, is it not? Uh, Paul was, he had taught the church at Corinth, he had built them up, he, had, uh, uh, he was a wise master builder laying that foundation of Christ. And, you know, the individual Christians are called spiritual stones, right? In 1 Peter chapter 2, spiritual stones in the temple of God. Well, if you... Now, here, here we obviously have some people who uh, make poor choices in their building materials. <clears throat> but if one does help to build up the church, but some of the work that they've produced, when the trials of life come and that individual falls away and, and, and no, uh, is no longer a part of that building, they don't want to have anything a part of it, then the way that I see this passage is, is that you're not going to be held responsible if you've done your best to build up on that foundation that's Jesus. You're not going to be held responsible for those that you convert that fall away. What do you all think about that? That's true. Uh, you know, I've known people uh, back home that stop coming to church like they should and things like that. And the way that people treat them is so, you know, they talk about them behind right. their back and they do all this. And, uh, you know, the person is driven further away when they could have possibly been, you know, been convinced by the Christian-like attitude. But that is, that is something that's true. You know, we have to be careful how we treat you know,
New Testament Christians that are in this transitional phase. Right. So the so the man he's he's brought these people into the church, and they're they're burned up with the chaff. They don't stand the test of the times, and yet the individual that brought them in, he himself is saved. Right? Or is that? I think that's. Yeah. Okay. That's that's. that's yeah, that's the way that I saw it as well. Um, I, we didn't bring out all these particular about the about the Judaism, but as you mentioned, this also applies to the other New Testament Christians as well. So, okay, Ashley. I had their understanding too, but I'm having some trouble with the second part of verse 15. Okay, the first part I'm getting is the work is burned up, the builder will suffer a great loss, um, the builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaped into a small flame. Ah. Uh. Sure. Um, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Okay, yet so as through fire. And are we talking about fire in terms of judgment? Yeah, uh, I, th- I think particularly First Peter, th- uh, First Peter 4 is a perfect example of this, because he says in verse 12, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is among you. And you learn that these fiery trials, you know, what do they, what do they produce? They produce patience in James chapter 1. They refine the gold and the silver that's there. But if you have, if you think about a big, this is silly, but if you think about, you know, um, maybe actually I'll go back to this. You know what the gold, what the what the fire does? It, it does purify those metals. Right. So it does take out any of the impurifications. Mm-hmm. So here you have a man that suffers loss, but he's saved through the fire. Now, if you convert somebody to Christ and they fall away, that's an awful thing, and that's obviously going to weigh heavy on you. You know, right. uh, for example, the father of the prodigal son. You know, he was so 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 saddened by his son's decision. He's sitting there waiting on him to come home, you know, day in and day out, looking out there across the horizon, waiting to see, you know, his son come over that hill. And so uh, it's kind of the same way. He, you suffer a loss, but you're going to be saved. You know, even though that's a sad thing for you to see someone that you converted to fall away, in the end, in this, this particular situation, notice you, I'm talking to the, as if you're a member of the church of Corinth. Um, that doesn't mean that you're going to be lost just because some of your work has been lost. Lonnie? Yeah, I was, I was thinking of the way that uh, it said, if any man, as I'm talking about it, someone, any person that is, go out and then they, they they do a good work, especially be able to win someone, you know, mm-hmm. it's talking about maybe that those, that those, those uh, individuals that they had went out and, and they converted or something like that, and they went back into the world, he, he lost, you know, he had lost those souls, they went back, but he understood he's going to be safe because he put both the That's what I'm saying. And what Monty said, I was reading up to that one point, but he said, yet he should be saved, yet so, as by fire. He would have to be tested too by the same fire. Yep, that's so right. Yeah. That, that, tested fire. that work that he lost, it was lost because of them falling away or whatever. He would lose those people, but then at the same time, he himself would be saved by fire because he wants to be tested too. Yep, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, Gary, did I see your hand flash while ago? No? It was because it's so hot in here. Okay. Oh, I know I might have to take off my, my uniform here. It's too hot. <laughs> yeah, so that version, the uh, that scripture, I don't like. The last yeah. part I don't like because it, it says the builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flame. I don't like that barely escaping because it's almost implies like he did something wrong. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So, yeah. Okay, that's why I want it's to just, be it, I, I, That might actually be suggesting the interpretation that I told you about that a friend had offered to me one time. So yeah, let's like let's get back to John 15. See if we can't fit, see if we can't uh, go back through this and uh, knock out this section verses one through eleven. That way we can pick up in verse twelve tonight. So Jesus is the true vine. Now, if Jesus is the true vine, that means that there's false vines out there, right? right. And so uh, the it would be important for the individuals in the first century to look at Jesus and figure out that he is that true vine. 
one thing that is interesting that y'all brought out is that one of the pictures of Israel, one of the one of the images that's used for Israel is what? Yeah, the, yeah, the vineyard of God, right? Um, that was used, for example, at the very last section of Matthew twenty-one. That parable of the vineyard, uh, Jesus draws on, and it's used in the Old Testament as well. This idea of the vineyard, yeah. and so Jesus, the point is, Jesus is the true vine. Okay, the Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away, and every bear, every branch that bears fruit. He prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Okay, so uh, this is no, notice what it what it is that prunes them, that cleans them. Verse three: You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. It's it's the word of God that would prepare these disciples to produce fruit, and specifically, the one thing that would continue to reveal the word to them and continue to keep them pruned and ready to bear fruit as evidenced in chapter 14, would be the Holy Spirit. Jesus would send the Holy Spirit uh, to assist them in this task of bearing fruit. Verse 4, he says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. So if you go off over here and start trying to make your own vine, or you know become your own independent thing, it's not going to work. You've got to draw your... Uh, you know, sustenance from me. And of course, this would be produced uh, through the Holy Spirit. That goes, along, I think, that, that goes along with what you, I think, John 10, 1, where you said anybody in the door except by the sheepfold would yep. be the same as a thief and a robber, you know? That's exactly right. And I think about this as being I was Biden and what the Word said and uh, right to divide. You know, that is, uh, it is, it is true. Well, Jesus is still divine, but right, we right. get the sustenance from the Word. That's right. So, okay, I can see, I see what you're saying there. Okay, uh, let's see. He says in verse five, "I am the vine; you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing." Now, this apart from me, you can do nothing does have reference back in chapter 14 to the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit that they would receive on Pentecost and what he would do through them. And so anything that they would accomplish, specifically in this context, dealing with those miraculous works and producing fruit in the world, uh, was directly related to Christ. They could not do it without Christ. In fact, in fact take a look at uh, Mark 16. And notice a phrase that's used here over and over and over again. Mark 16, verse 17 and 18. Somebody read that in the King James Version, please. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing. It shall not hurt them. They shall lay they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Okay, so it didn't say it ever over and over and over again, but it was uh, sort of implied over and over and over again. All that would be done how? In my name. Right. By my authority. That's right. Um, oh this is where it's at. Matthew seven twenty two. This is where the one where it has in thy name, in thy name, in thy name. Uh, Matthew 7, 22 says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons. And in your name perform many wondrous works and many miracles. So, in thy name, in thy name, in thy name, Mark 16, in my name you'll do this, 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 and this. So this is basically the same thing that's being said in John 15. Uh, these things that you're going to do, you're only going to be able to do them if you do them in my name. If you don't do them in my name, it's not going to go like you think it will. The world, the world is full of them in Jesus' name. They take everything they get, everything they do. They say, God is blessing me in the, in, the, in the name of Jesus and all this stuff. They use it, but it's not in faith. You know, it's not according to the word of God. Right. Well, so, 
that phrase in my name is not a special incantation you can speak that automatically authorizes everything you do like some magic spell it's a uh, you know it's a it's by the authority of Jesus and just because you say by the authority of Jesus doesn't make it by the authority of Jesus it has to go back to this word that he spoke in the first few verses where he talks about the word that prunes them if it's not in line with the word it's not in the name of Jesus right. I, I was just writing something just the other day and uh, I had to think about mirror and I said ain't no way in the Bible talking about the Bible talking about the Bible talking about the Bible mirror this is Jesus told the disciples praying in his name you know what I'm talking about so a lot of people don't look at that you know praying to, to Mary or other things you know that they're praying to but the Bible teaches us different so right. if you're going to believe in what the word says you know, believe it, but if you don't know about some other man, you know, you're heading the wrong way. Sounds good. Anybody else? This text is so sorely abused by the snake handlers uh-huh. in West Virginia, West Virginia, oh, yeah. and Ohio, Southeast Ohio. Uh, there was a program on the internet. Right. Yeah, people. That's right. That's what I, I hope that we all learn that we gotta have a sincere heart if we want to win. Right? You know, because people are being led astray. You know, and they're not going by the Bible. They take the scripts out of context, and and the people that they are dealing with, they think that since the Bible says it must be right, but well, it's out of context. We have that saying, uh, we speak where the Bible speaks, we're silent where the Bible is silent. But it should be, do we speak as the Bible speaks? Because you can speak where the Bible speaks and not be speaking as the Bible speaks, like you're saying. Okay, let's look at verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. They gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. And so here you have... You know, what happens if they didn't allow this word to influence their lives? If they didn't if they didn't utilize the Holy Spirit that they've been given. Uh, that kind of reminds me, you know, there's I think there's two places in the New Testament. One in First Thessalonians five, and the other it's either in First Timothy or Second Timothy, where Paul urges his audience in both places to quench not the spirit. Or don't despise, you know, the gift that you've been given. And I think the same thing could be uh, said for this passage here in, in John 15. You know, if, if they don't abide in Jesus, if they're not utilizing this gift that Jesus has given them, then they're not going to be able to produce any fruit. Uh, and they're not going to be able to distinguish between a true vine and a false vine and things like that. Okay, I cast them into the fire and they're burned. This is obviously talking about specifically branches being thrown into fire. Uh, This is just talking about how they're not going to be part of the vine if if they're not abiding in Jesus. Okay, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. We talked about this last week. This has to do with the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit in particular. Okay, my Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Prove to be my disciples. I I can't help but see the, at least a similarity between this and 2 Peter chapter 1. Because you look at 2 Peter chapter 1, and that whole chapter is about making, or that whole section is about making your calling and election sure. And this is about proving to be the disciples through producing fruit. How did they make their calling and election sure in Second Peter one? By not being barren, by not being unfruitful. And so again, I can't help but see the, uh, the correlation between these two passages. Okay, uh, verse nine. Just as the father.